temperature. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think this is an ordinary salam. Normal salam we give every day. But in the presence of a guest, traveled all the way, I think the salam needs to be more energetic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mashallah, mashallah. So the guest feels that he is now welcomed, and we are here, inshallah, um, both physically and mentally, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka sallam, tasneeman kathira wa ba'd. Qala azza min qail, inna ma yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-unama. We once again thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity to gather here and benefit and learn from our scholars. The verse that I have just recited indicates the honor and the dignity of scholars, particularly those who are disseminating qala Allah and qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who are teaching us the importance of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, those who are teaching us how to lead our day-to-day -day lives. The world that we are living in is progressing. And before you realize it, before you realize, before you know it, it's going to be too late if you don't, if you don't wake up. I'm not saying we are sleeping, but the Sheikh is here to tell us things that we need to be aware of, inshallah. So, I promise you I've got maybe maybe 10 pages of his bio, uh, but I don't know if, inshallah, with his permission, we'll just cut it short. So, we are privileged and honored to have in our midst Dr. Faisal Ahmad Manju, who is a sheikh and a bearer of the Qur'an, inshallah. But he also holds PhD in two fields, Islamic finance, as well as in law, mashallah. Last night, when we went to pick him up, I was curious. So I asked him, what motivated you to have the combination of these two fields? And then he explained something very interesting to me. He says, now you're in Australia, if a person comes to you and he wants to draw a banquet or a will, how do you do it if you don't know the law of the land? So Alhamdulillah, the Sheikh is serving the Ummah in many fields and in many capacities. He's involved in many, uh, he's teaching in many universities, mashallah. He's currently a lecturer at McField Institute of Higher Education. He is also an associate tutor at one of the universities and he's got an affiliation to many unis. Uh, he gives uh, advices to high courts and all those things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for all his hard work. And uh, just so that we understand the value of the scholar, he holds almost 10 degrees with him, mashallah. So we are privileged to have a man in our midst who has specialized in a field that we're all interested in, particularly when you're living in Western countries, Islamic finance. So we changed his uh, topic. Without his consultation, we wanted to test him, but I realized he's a man that he cannot test. Uh, just talking to me last night, he tells me that he has prepared almost 350 slides. So I told him, Sheikh, but now your title has changed to cryptocurrency. He says, don't worry, I've got uh, PowerPoint pre already prepared on this. So, uh, mashallah, just today we dropped him off in the morning after midnight at 1, I think 1 a.m. This, mashallah, 3 a.m. he's busy sending me things. And in the morning he had, uh, he had to go to Asarat College. What's Asarat College? Epic. Epic. How far is it from here? Two hours. Two hours. So a man, at 3 a.m. he's sending things, 10 a.m. he goes to Epic. And uh, mashallah, he's young, but he's not as young as you think. Mashallah. So he spends the, I think he had two hour session there with all the teachers and uh, leadership uh, team and few schools came together and learned, benefited from the Sheikh. 
he delivered on a topic of Islamic pedagogy. And from there, the uh, brother Suleiman was waiting for him at the hotel to bring him at, before Maghrib. He says, I'm stuck in traffic. And he just gets home, by the way, he came with his family. He just comes at, to the hotel. He doesn't greet his wife properly, he comes to us. So, subhanAllah, sometimes I feel guilty that when people come to me with a need and um, I give excuses like, uh, it's my family time. These are people, mashallah, that are giving the time for deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward the shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate his ranks in the year after. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the suhbah of Anbiya alayhim salam the companionship of Sahaba, Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. And we also thank you and our sisters downstairs for coming to join us uh, this evening. The topic is cryptocurrency, halal or haram. Inshallah, we are live on, uh, on Facebook. Jazakum Allah khairan, fali yatafaddal nashkura. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasul kareem. Right. The topic, uh, why is it important? Because uh, you want it or not, you are already involved in it. If you are not involved in it, in the next five years, you will be involved in it. There is a tendency worldwide to have digital currency at governmental level. For example, in Britain, we are talking about Greek coin. In India, we are talking about e-rupees. In Nigeria, it's about e-naira. It's coming. You want it or not, it's coming. The major banks, like JP Morgan, is already directly involved in it, right, and many other banks. That is in terms of currency. In terms of asset, as you know, many countries are declaring it an asset because when you buy a Bitcoin or whatever, you sell it, there is an increase in value. And that is, it will be subjected to capital gains tax, which is usually 20%. So, you can see, either you treat it as a currency, you treat it as a, what you call a token. A token is like a share. So instead of a company issuing shares, they will issue a token, right? This is an electronic format. It gives it to you, it's on a blockchain, it's quite secure. So instead of issuing what you call a IPO, initial public offer, so when a company wants to issue, come. Uh, raise money through the capital market, they issue shares. You, you call it a share, so initial public offer. So when they just say somebody wants $1 million, they issue 1 million shares of $1 each, they got $1 million. Now what is happening now, if somebody wants to raise money, instead of issuing shares, they will issue a token, and that will be known as ICO, Initial Coin Offer. So which means, maybe in 10 years' time, your share market will be replaced, which goes into trillions of dollars, will be replaced by token. Instead of IPOs, we're going to have ICOs. So the world is going to change drastically. There was a paper written by the IMF, I got it, if you want to read it, if you've got time to read it. A survey was carried out from 2012 to 2019 in 25 countries, mainly among the youth. Whether they want to work with digital money, that is through their digital wallet in their, in their yani, they will pay with this, right? It comes, I mean, many are using it. Or do they want to use fiat money, that is your paper money? The tendency among the youth is not to use fiat money, which means the next generation is pointless printing money and give them money. They want to pay with their mobile phone. So you can see how the world will change, either in terms of the financial market, in terms of payment, in terms of savings, it, it will change. You want it or not, 
it will change. Now in this change, we as Muslims, we are worried this new product, will Allah be happy with us or not? And this fear that we have is nothing new. We, when, when fiat money was introduced, the Muslim of that time had the same fear because the previous generations were using dirham and dinar. As you know, the Quran talks about dirham. Dinar is a gold coin. They were not using paper money. So when paper money comes, it was a paper, how can it has value? How can paper has value? If I give you 1,000 rupees of India here, how can you use it? You can't use it. Unless you go and change it, nobody will accept it. Leave alone rupees. If I give you gold, I tell you go to a shop and buy Pepsi with that. They will call the police. What are you doing with a big piece of gold in my shop? You stole it somewhere or what? Nobody accepts gold anymore as a mode of payment. You understand? Things are changing. This is why you call it fiqul mu'amala. And one of the differences between commercial transactions and ibadat, you will see that in ibadat, the ayat of Quran and hadith are quite consequential. Whereas for mu'amalat, for our commercial transactions, it is relatively less in the Quran and Sunnah. Why? Because society evolved, you got the basic fundamental principles, based on those principles, we evolve our Muslim Masail. I give you an example to understand. If you read Surah Kahaf, when the ashab Kahaf woke up after 300 years, it is in Surah Kahaf, 15th para, you can go and read. They appointed one of their companion with some darahim, the Quran mentioned darahim, to go and buy some food in the market. That is a coin, dirham, silver coin. When he went on the market with this money, they refused to accept this money. It was silver. But the shape of the silver was not accepted the Quran mentioned Darahim. The question arises. It was silver coin, it was not accepted. From there, Oloma extracted a very important principle, especially Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi, Ibn Qayyim Jawzi rahmatullahi, Imam Malik rahmatullahi. These are the great figures in Islamic history. They say that the concept of money is based on or or means the custom. Based the custom, what people are used to. That is what money is. Example, in the time of Hazrat Umar ta'ala, there was a shortage of coin. So Hazrat Umar ta'ala called the Sahaba. He said, what if you made the hide of camel, the skin of camel as Money. Listen properly. He was changing the money because there was not enough coin to mint. Remember, the money used in the time of Rasulullah Sallam were not minted in Arabia. It was the coin from the Byzantium Empire or the Persian Empire. Go and read history, you will see. The Islamic coin came with Marwan. He was, I think, the seventh Khalifa or eighth Khalifa. He is the one who started minting so-called Islamic coin. In the time of Islam, there was no concept of Islamic coin. Islamic coin. You follow what I'm saying? There was no concept of a central bank who will issue the coin or the, or, or the money. People were printing, printing their own coin. You got to understand all this. It was not centralized. In the time of Rasulullah Alright? You follow what I'm saying? The concept of money. For him to share. <coughs> this is how it was in Tariq. Right? Then we had... So the Ashab-i Kahaf, when he took his own silver coin on the market, 
that silver coin was not accepted from there you can see it is based on the custom on the market what constitutes money and what doesn't constitute money it depends on the acceptability on the market i give you a very recent case in the 1970s not far many of you have seen 1970s i can see that in cambodia there was the khmer rouge the junta the the like the army took over and you know what were the money any idea what money they were using rice they were making rice into cubes and that was the currency in cambodia in the 1970 when the khmer rouge were running the country so the concept of money evolves we have to understand that right so when the muslim they had paper money all of us say but what is this do you pay zakat on this or you don't pay zakat that also is a fiqh debate do you pay? of course all of us say you pay zakat why did it have value why paper money had value it's just a piece of paper it got value because government has made it a legal tender that's only a reason it got value if government tells you it's not it does, we have changed the paper money it has no value you follow what i'm saying this is what you call governmental denomination the government is telling you it has value government is backing it up then only that paper has value if government decide to change the money it has no value like it happens in 2017 in india if you remember when they changed the i think it was a 2000 rupees note so all the old old absolutely no value overnight it has no value the same thing happened in myanmar overnight they change the money no value so you have to understand the concept of currency and money what is the difference between currency and money that also is a question what is the difference between currency and money money is a is a denomination the term used by a given authority to tell you this is the money we going to use for example pound sterling australian dollars us dollars this is money currency is the actual notes circulating so conceptually one is money and practically one is currency this is why you don't say crypto money we say cryptocurrency can you use it and circulate it to do transaction and we call it crypto asset because can you make it actually an asset you can buy and sell you can use it as a share is that okay this is the debate that we are talking i give you a very brief this is a very brief introduction if not there are tons of books written on money so as a lawyer i would like to make a disclaimer i'm very sharp i don't want you to sue me this is just an introductory debate i don't want you if you want to know more go and see your consult your mulbi sahab if you want to sue you see my sue imam sahab not sue me <laughs> sue the lawyers yeah so i'm not liable for any wrong decision you take because in one hour i cannot discuss thousands of books i can only give you a taste all right keep this in mind so you got to consult the consult the experts and the all of my kiram before you take a decision so what i'm going to discuss here is contextualization of the debate this debate is not now it goes about 10, 10 years this debate about cryptocurrency and if you go back there's a book by charles proctor meaning of money in 18 in 1985 there were two american experts in money 1985 they were already discussing the nature of digital money 1985 most of you maybe were not born that time so it's not a new debate this people who are in the field they have this vision already for example jules verne in the 1940s already wrote the book 
l'homme sur la lune. So he was a French philosopher, man on the moon. And in that book, he was explaining how people will float on the moon. He has a vision. He read, he documented, and he visualized something and said, this will happen. So these are things which people could see well in advance in the 1985, that there will be a time where people will start talking about virtual money. And then they give all the characteristics. So we have to understand and contextualize it. What is exactly the problem that the Muslims are asking? Contextualizing the debate because there are so many fatawas outside there. Some telling you it's haram. Halas. Some tell you halal. Some tells you wait a bit, let's government pass some regulation and then we'll decide. So these are the three groups of fatawas that I have given. I tried to pigeonhole them. You get some group of ulama say no, this cannot be money, it cannot be asset. What is this? It's just few figures, electronic figures under the computer. How can this be money? Right? On what basis not backed by anything? And I say, no, this is based on orf and custom of the market. But many of them would say, you see what? You can consider it as money or asset, but because it's very volatile, you can lose your money overnight, you can become a millionaire overnight as well. That demands regulation. Let the government regulate it, let the government protect it, because as Muslim, one of the maqasid of Sharia is hizul mal. You must protect your mal. So by regulation, you will be protected. For example, in England, if you put your money in the bank, a savings account, and the, ba the bank goes bankrupt, you are protected up to 85,000 pounds by the central bank. So you put money in the bank, you deposit money in the bank, it is regulated by the central bank, for whatever reason, the bank collapses. The central bank will give you up to 85,000 pounds. Is that okay? So this is where the ulama said, you've got to protect yourself a bit. Let's more regulation coming. So now we are start getting regulation slowly, slowly. For example, the European Union, there are also European Union directives. It's coming. India also has come with some laws. It's not full-fledged. Because there is a lot of politics involved there, there's a lot of international finance involved there. It's not something we can come overnight and say, okay, here's a cryptocurrency. No, it's not like this. It takes time. Slowly, slowly it's coming. So you've got to contextualize the debate. Then we have to understand the meaning of money and commodity from economic theories, because we are using it for our economic transactions, from a legal perspective and a fiqh perspective. And then we try to come to a conclusion, all right? Now, contextualizing a debate within the confine of fatwa. As I told you, there are a group of ulama who say it's haram. Then you got a group of ulama who completely say it's halal. I've already met those ulama, this is what I'm saying. Without an iota of doubt, they say no, it's halal. Go. Bye. Then, there's a group who tells you, no, wait a bit, let the law come clear about it. Let the government come with a regulatory framework. You see, the world financial system, for example, you live in Canada. You cannot live in isolation because your Canadian dollars is linked to the US dollar. It's linked to the European Union, uh, Euro, etc. How it's linked? because you got the forex market, exchanging of currencies. Now those forex markets are regulated by international regulation. For example, one of the regulators for banks in the world are the Basel Committee in Switzerland. They control all the central banks in the world. They issue standards. And then they appoint the World Bank or the IMF to be the watchdog. So there is a system outside there. You cannot live in isolation and you say, okay, let's go with the law. It's not like this in practice. You need to be regulated. Okay? And regulation is meant to protect the public. 
So, therefore, so this group of ulama, they are of the view that before you find halal, what is halal or haram, let's wait a little, let's more law comes in, let's more regulation comes in, and believe me, there are enough case laws going to court now, we're getting more clarity what it is, right? So there has been a major shift from the complete halal in the beginning to the complete haram in the recent years. You will find, for example, Turkey, the way Mufti, in India, in Egypt, in UK. There is this tendency, the ulama say, no, don't, don't, don't buy it. They're reluctant about it, especially when the Bitcoin crash, if you remember. And then suddenly go to sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Then the following morning you wake up, it came to twenty thousand dollars. People are losing money. All right. So this versatility, this yo-yo at the market, it's not stable. Therefore, industry people have been trying to counter our users' fatawas, which is coming from the main source, maybe the, the mufti, the grand mufti of Egypt or whatever, right? So the people who are the industry they can see that this is going to be the future. And you are giving me fatwa, it is haram. You understand? I've got all those fatwas. It's not something secret. It is on Google. You can find it. Yeah. So this is where the people who are in the industry say, come on, step back. Are you really understanding what is a blockchain? Do you understand what is cryptography? Do you understand the concept of money? Do you understand economics? Do you understand many economic theories about money before you are making those decisions? Because ultimately you're going to use it. I give you an example, brothers. There was a time in the 1940s. If you look at the fatawa of using our watch for prayer, it was problematic. You got to go and measure the shadow. <laughs> Those who studied fiqh will know. From this shadow to this shadow is for asr. From this shadow to this shadow is asr. They were measuring shadow and not according to the watch. Because why? They could not understand the importance of the observatory, how precise mathematically the observatory can give you the time of the movement of the sun. Now when they understand it, who go out to measure the sun now? Nobody. If you go to Egypt, so Turkey, for example, in few massages you will find this wrong thing that measures the shadow up to now. What they have developed in those days, you can see it in many massages in Turkey. This is how they were deciding the time for azan and so on. Now who, do, who is doing this now? Nobody. Nobody. If I ask you how many of you can go and measure shadow outside, most of you won't know how to do it. Yeah, so when you understand the technology, then you accept it. There was a time where some fatawa was, you cannot make weather forecast. You must not believe in weather forecast. Yes, the sky is clear. They tell you in two days time there will be thunder, but the sky is clear. How can it be thunderstorm? Now with satellite and all those things, just show you how the cloud is moving. We're understanding it better. But there was a time when people were doubting weather forecast. There were fatawa given on that. Okay? So when we talk about fiqhul mu'amala, this was sharia, has not given casting stone. There's not too many ayat of Quran or hadith there are. But it is left to flexibility. As society moves, the all of my kiram will sit and ponder at times they will ask the scientists or the lawyers and they will try to adjust accordingly. So this is what we are talking here. Some group of ulama, according to their understanding about the blockchain, where this whole money is produced, they say, no, you can't accept that because just few fig uh, digital figures, how can this be money? Some say, you know, but this is based on all. Some say, no, it's going to be imposed on you by government in any case. You want it or not, you're going to have digital currency from the central bank. What are you going to say? You, you've got to call it zarura, necessity, whatever you want to call it, you are going to use it. Just like the fiat money, there was a time that they didn't want to use fiat money. They want to use gold and silver. Nowadays, nobody uses gold and silver. Everybody is using fiat money, paper money. So that is how society moves.
So what are the clarity Muslims are looking for? Can they buy with cryptocurrency and can they invest in it? This is what the question you want to ask me. All right? Can you invest in cryptocurrency and can you pay with cryptocurrency? For example, there are some companies, right? When you buy a computer, you want to pay with your wallet in terms of Bitcoin, no problem. You pay. They allow it. Okay? In other words, can it be considered as currency or a commodity? Two words. Is it a currency or is it an asset? Two words. So if you want to use it to buy pizza or to pay your rental or to pay your hotel when you're traveling, whatever it is, then it becomes a currency. If you want to get, buy a token from a company and it becomes like a share for you, that becomes an asset. Now, when is something a currency in Sharia? When is something considered as an asset in Sharia? That is a question that you are asking me. That is, is it a currency? Does it got the criteria to be fulfilled Sharan for me to go and buy with it? Or is it a mali mutaqawwim? In fiqh you call it. Is it a commodity of economic value that satisfies the Shari ruling to be considered as a commodity? That is a question that the people want to ask the ulama as a general rule. Regarding the first scenario, virtually all fatawa are referring to the metallic theory of money. When understanding money, most of the fatawa are going through, they go back on the theory of money when gold and silver were being used. You call it the, the bimetallist theory of money. Right? If you read the fatwa, you will see it. Okay? Is that enough in today's time? You can you contact yourself with the bimetallic theory of money. That is silver and gold. It's a question. My answer is no. That's not adequate. Why is not adequate? Because this theory, the biometallic theory, is based on, in economics we call it, the functional theory of money. That is, you consider money, understanding money, in relation to its function in society. Not in itself, in its, the function it has in society. Then you decide whether it is money or not. I gave you the example of the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s who were using cube rice as their money in Cambodia. All right? So we have to understand where those fatawas are coming from. Okay? Number two, regarding the second question, whether it's a commodity, the main issue being raised is that cryptocurrency does not have an intrinsic value and thus has few speculative values. It is not asset-backed either like shares. So should it be concerned as mali mutaqawwim? That is a bit complicated now. Let me explain that. This mobile, you will tell me it is a commodity that has economic value because it has a value within itself. If I take this mobile, I take it on Kilimanjaro or the Himalayas, Still, it is a mobile. Still, you can use it. You just change your SIM card. Because the value is in it itself. Your car, your horse, your water. Wherever you go, it has a value. Now, if I take this here, what is this? Fiat currency. <laughs> yeah, what exactly it is? British, British. Power? Five pounds. Oh, five pounds. No, it's 51. <laughs> it's zero there, yeah? Prior to that, there was another one that we were using. If you go to England now, you use the previous one, nobody will accept it. Nobody will accept it. Because it's no more considered as money. There was another one before that. Okay? If I take this, I go to Himalaya. And the guy is selling ice cream or something. I mean, who would drink ice cream on, on the Himalayas now? Somewhere, whatever it is, coffee, yeah? Okay? 
he won't take that money. He doesn't even know what it is, the poor guy selling coffee. You understand? For him, this is not money. He got no value. Because this is not a legal tender in Nepal. You got that? This, he will buy it from you because he can use it. You got an intrinsic value in itself. This one got no intrinsic value in itself. The law that gives it value. The country you are in that gives it value. Do you understand? The concept of intrinsic value. So in Sharia, when we say something got value, we want to know intrinsically whether it has a value for the public to say, yes, it is a commodity. Will the public accept it that it got intrinsic value with it itself? That is what we call mali mutaqawwim. How do we determine whether crypto asset is a mali mutaqawwim? So one is whether it is currency. The second one is your token is a mali mutaqawwim. Two questions there. Both are in the blockchain. Both are in the blockchain. But did what name you use? On what basis you issuing it? That is where the difference is. Is that okay? Everybody following me? Okay. Now, because these are new things, it is based primarily on the concept of ORF. ORF means custom. It is a tertiary source of Islam. When you look at Islamic law, it is like a pyramid. You divide the pyramid into three layers. The top layers, layer you call it primary source. That is Quran and Sunnah. The second layer, there is something called analogical deduction, called Qiyas or Ijma. Ijma means consensus of Sahaba or the ulama of the same time on a given issue, etc. Or analogical deduction. That is something new. You do not have it in Quran and Sunnah. You go back in the Quran so to see if there is something similar to it and then you extrapolate the rule. Then you get a third category, for example, opinion of a Sahabi, public interest, uh, or that is custom, all these form part of the tertiary sources of Islam. So Orf is a tertiary source, therefore, when you look at money in Islam, as I explained early on, the concept of money often is understood by Orf. That is, what is the prevailing money in the market? Does the public accept it as a medium of exchange? Does the public accept it as a yardstick for value? Does the public accept it as a store of value? These are the characteristics of money. And I gave you the example of in the time of Umar bin Khattab as well. That is, he wanted to use the skin or the hide of camel. Then Sahaba said there will be no camel left. Everybody will kill the camel. Yeah. So we have shifted from the real economy towards a financial economy, which demands legal construction of these modern concepts that are pillars in our modern economic order. This is very, very important. There is a book by McCormick, uh, Risk on Capital Market. If you want to read, you can go and read. What does that mean? In the time of Rasulullah if you want a camel, the camel is in front of you, you can touch it, you decide, you go and buy it. You want to eat dates, you go and see the date, you touch it, you eat it, you feel it, it got a value in itself. That is a real economy. That is things you are dealing which got a value within itself. This is no more the case now. If you take an economy like UK, almost 70% of the economy is based on the service industry, not the manufacturing industry. So you get the banking sector, the insurance sector, the stock market, the pension market. This is what is really propulsing the economy. It's a financial economy, not a real economy as such. So we are living, for example, on, let me give you an example of a financial instrument, a pension, uh, for example, your insurance policy. 
What is an insurance policy? Think about it. It is a contract between the insurer and the insured regarding, is a contract, a risk should it materialize, the insurance company will indemnify you. This is what this paper is all about. It's a paper. But if this paper is not in line with the Insurance Act, for example, that paper is void. It has no value. So what you write on that paper which has value, not the paper itself, the same thing with shares, the same thing with bonds, the same thing with derivatives, the same thing with options, the same thing with insurance policy, the same thing with a check. These are just documents, piece of paper. What you write on it which has value, not the paper. Therefore, you got to make a legal construction, understand what it entails. And this is where the Fukaha will have to understand when we shift from a real economy towards a financial economy, you are dealing with those financial instruments that governs our life. It's not the paper which is important. What is written in the paper, from a fiqh point of view, is it valid or not? That is the technical point you have to understand when you move towards a financial economy. So legal construction often leads to economic theories and regulatory provisions. Now, when something is accepted from an Islamic point of view, whether something which is customary on the market, number one, it should all embracing and dominant. This is something which is prevailing on the market. This is why you call it customary. Number two, custom must be established at the time of legislation. So when you're making the deal, everybody knows that this is the custom. Custom must not disagree with Sharia text. Custom must not violate a clear stipulation of an agreement. Contractual agreements take preference over custom. If you agree on something, the custom is something else, your contractual terms will prevail. The question here is, does cryptocurrency satisfy this to be a currency? That's the question. Can you say that cryptocurrency satisfies those things? What do you think? We don't know. Okay. I'll give you another exercise in a few minutes. Don't worry. I'll make you become mufti today. Don't worry. <laughs> like, okay, what is money? Define money and commodity. Again, from an economic theory, a money, legal, and fiqh perspective. I discussed what is the difference between money and currency already. Now, users, look at the differences. You know, I know I'm pushing you a bit. This is academic standard here. I tell my teachers, I teach this at master's level also at time. But, okay, no problem, let's understand it. Let us take the, the difference between currency and money. Why we talk cryptocurrency, the crypto money? When we talk about money, using the use of money and currency, money represents the actual value of goods and services. Currency is a medium used to make day-to-day -day payments. This is what I told you, right? So pounds turning, Australian dollars, this is your money. Your currency is the notes you're using, all right? It's store of value, it serves as store of value, it is just used to make transactions, right? When we say you are 20 pound in the banks, when the government decides to change the currency, the piece of paper, change the color for example you still got 20 pounds in the bank or 20 dollars so the money is in the bank the currency has changed the government has changed the money but the currency in the bank remains the same right so the same thing tangibility it is intangible but the currency is tangible the money is intangible the money is a concept dollars, pounds, euros, the currency is actual paper or whatever format it is. And this is a question that we ask. We can still have a digital euro. We can have digital Australian dollars. We can have digital pounds. We call it Bitcoin. So in terms of money, it is still the money, but the currency has changed.
it becomes digital. Instead, it's a paper, it goes into your wallet. Do you understand? So the money itself is there, but the currency has changed. A bit too technical? Yeah, you understand? I know nobody told you that before. I know that. It's a bit technical. But you've got to understand those things to understand what the Fuqaha are saying. Because the Fuqaha won't explain you to all this. They will tell you halal or haram, yes or no. Tick tack, tick box. Yeah? You've got to understand why they're saying that. Yeah? Okay? So you can go and functions and examples and so on. Right? Now, money itself, as the theory has evolved, Understand that properly. It's not static, as I mentioned earlier. First, if you go one, two, three thousand years, maybe five thousand years ago, the concept of money was barter. If I wanted this mobile phone and you wanted this water, and you got this, I, and I need this, what we do? You give me, I give you my mobile I, because you need the mobile, and. I need the water, you exchange the mobile for the water. That is known as barter system. Barter. There was no yardstick to say, okay, this mobile is 400 pounds and this one is only one pound. It is based on what I need and what I don't need and exchange it. There was no yardstick of value. Money gives yardstick of value. Nowadays, if I Tell you, hey, give me your mobile, I give you what? Hey, go, man. Give me 1,000 like this, then I give you it. Yeah, you understand? Why? Because in your mind, there is a money in your mind. This is $400, this is $1. It's 400 to 1. Those days, we didn't have the concept of money. It was on demand. I need the sheep, you have the dagger, we exchange it. This is barter. I need that wheat, and you need that, I don't know, popo, and you exchange it. This is how it was. There was no yardstick to measure the value. Right? This was barter. Then, men, they were using shell and so on. Finally, they discovered that men using platter was gold and silver because there are so many types of metals. You could have used platinum and many types, copper. But men, since those days, liked gold and silver. So, they started minting the coins according to whatever civilization it is this is what you call the metallic theory according to the value of gold and silver the minting the weight of it that gives you the value then we move away from this we came into the state theory now this is important when they started financing wars government needed money they were started issuing fiat money right that started in the 19th century, right? And even the Ottoman, yes, even the Ottoman did it. People don't know about it yet. Even the Ottoman had fiat money, all right, for wars. So the state started issuing money for two reasons. One is they needed money. They couldn't have gold enough, so they used this, number one. Number two, they went out to standardize the economy. If they want to tax you, they got a unit to tax everybody. So that money becomes the standard to tax everybody. Number three, they could control it because they are the ones who would put that money on the economy to facilitate the development. This is what you call the state theory. So it's the government now who has taken the responsibility to produce money. It was not left in the hands of people. They decided to print the money through the central bank or whatever. Then later on, when the government, say for example, the government put $40 billion on the market for argument's sake, I don't know the... I told you I make a caveat here, I don't know about Australia, my first visit. So, excuse me, I'm just giving examples. Say we need 40 billion dollars. The government is not going to come and give you 40 billion. It goes via the banking sector. 
like they are hiring this money. So when the government issues the money, that is known as the hard currency. When the banking sector gets it, the banking sector will create artificial money of it, fractional reserve. So say for example, you are paid your money, you put it in the bank. The law will tell the bank, you must keep 10% of it just in case the client wants the money back. The remaining, you give it as a loan. So we start with 100, now 90 goes back in the economy. He comes back to another bank, he keeps 9, because 10% of 90. He put 81 on the market, then 8, the next bank. So from 100, you got 100 plus, uh, so 10 is, so from 100, you created 90, you created 81. These are known as credit money. This is where the banking sector makes its money. And this is where you got the modern credit money theory. Artificial money is created. Is that okay? You understand? That is known as fractional reserve. You pick up any books on economics, you go and read. I'm putting it in very simple term here, yeah? There's a lot of theory behind it. Now, this credit money is centralized. It is centralized. The government controls how much, because this is from part of the Keynesian theory of money, where you use money to control the economy, inflation, employment, etc. It was centralized. Now people say, why it must be centralized? It must be decentralized. And this is where we got the decentralized of digital money, where, as you know, uh, the white paper was written about Bitcoin, and they were using it in the dark web and underground transaction, etc. Now it has become well known all over the world, and most of us are dealing with a decentralized digital money. It got nothing to do with the government, Companies are issuing the same, like Ethereum, Stablecoin, Dogecoin. There are about more than 1,200 types of digital currency nowadays. More than this. All over the world, people. Now you go to Hong Kong, you get, just like you have a stock market for shares, you got people are buying, selling. Instead of shares, they are buying digital currencies. Like in Hong Kong, they are having. You go on Google, you'll find it. So that was the decentralized. But with the decentralized, as we have seen, many people lost money. There is a lot of scam. A lot of hackers come into your system. I know about it, I've read, I'm sure you have read already. This needs to be controlled. And this is where there's a cry for centralizing it again. To protect the public. And for other reasons, of course. Now we are talking about DeFi, DEFI. Now we are talking of centralization. We are going to centralize those digital money. So this is a very theory that we are talking about. Understand how the theory of money changes over the time. It's not that, hey, Molana, Molbi Saab, Chef, is it halal or haram to invest in? It's not that easy to give a fatwa. This is why the ulama, some say yes, some are saying no. We we got to understand it's still evolving. So don't blame and get angry with the ulama. You people are fighting among them. They are not fighting among themselves. It depends how you understand the situation, the precaution you are taking, how society is evolving, which country you are, the technological advancement, what is the purpose of certifying, think about it, about the digital currency, and the internet does not work. You're going to paralyze the economy. You follow what I'm trying to say? You do have so many countries in the world up to now, the internet doesn't work properly. Your 4G or 5G are not working properly. They don't have sufficient. Now you go into the bank to buy your food. You paying and you paying, nothing is going through because there's no connection. You follow? So you got to look at all those things before we criticize Oloma. Don't criticize Oloma, left hand side, right hand side. 
Those who tell you no, they got their reason. Those who tell you yes, they got their reason. Those who tell you wait a little bit more, they got their reason why they're telling us. Okay? So this become a definition of problems of money. Defining money has become an intricate issue because of its role and legal implications in modern financial world. Economists define the definitions and adopt the functional definition, for instance. As I told you, it must have value, it's a store of value, it is portable, it, is, it doesn't perish, uh, it is a yardstick of value, etc. This is a functionality of money. This is where they come. So the legal fraternity adopts a definition. If you look at law, you might tie up with a definition which is different from the economist. And the metallic theory of money, metallism, I explained that already. Shortalism, I explained already. And money as standard of different payment. This was mainly from Alfred Michel Innes, who in 1914 argued that money existed not as a medium of exchange, but as a standard of different payment, with government money being debt the government could reclaim by taxation. This is what I told you. They print it, it is my money of the economy, I put it back there, you're using it, there must be a sort of return for the government. Then you get the modern theories or neo uh, cartelism or circuitism. Now, this is, I've spoken a lot about the convention. Let's look at the fifth point. The problem, fifth, is you got the hard money and the credit money. The hard money is what the central bank or the government will put on the market. The credit money is what the conventional banks are going to create artificially by fractional reserve. Do you understand? Do you understand that point? So you can put 100 pound, the law says the bank must keep 10, the fractional reserve, you reserve 10. Therefore 90 you can put in the market. So basically it's 190 in the market now. In the book it's 190. So the bank owe you 100, and somebody owed the bank 90. So in the economy, there are 190 now. In fact, there is only 100. You have created 90. Now this 90 gets into the bank. The law says you must keep 10%. So you keep 9. Okay? Out of 90, you keep 9. 81 you put in the market. Now another 81 goes. These are digital or uh, loans that you are giving. Right? So you are creating through fractional reserve, artificial money, or credit money, or loan money. Right? This is what is happening. All right? So more fatawa on money so far deals with hard money supply, and the credit money, there are very few fatawa on the credit money. So this is a debate that is going on now. So if you look at Bitcoin nowadays, this is how volatile it is, right? Very volatile as a currency. So, so this was our economics point of view. If you look at the legal characteristic of money under state theory of money, it must be expressed by reference to a name, pound sterling, Australian dollars, US dollar, Indian rupee. That is what it means. There must be a name denominated by reference to a unit. For example, one rupee is 100 cents, uh, one dollar, 100 cents, or whatever. You must have a unit which in each case is prescribed by the law of the state concerned. Number two, the currency and units so prescribed must be intended to serve as a generally accepted measure of value and measure of exchange within the state concern. This is why if you go to a shop, they refuse to take your money, they can't refuse because this is a legal tender. The government is telling you this is money. You must accept it. You cannot tell the client, I don't need, I can't accept this money. Legally, they can't refuse you that. Many people don't realize. Yes, a, the a, a, a shopkeeper can refuse your check because a check is not a legal tender. <laughs> a check is not a legal tender. It's a creation of the bank. Whereas the money is a creation of the government and the government is telling you this is a legal tender. You have to accept it. So that is a legal dimension. Now, coming to cryptocurrency, no government has told you that Bitcoin, besides El Salvador, nobody is telling you that Bitcoin is a legal tender. You must accept it and pay you with Bitcoin. That's a problem. 
You cannot force people to accept your Bitcoin. If I want to buy this for one Bitcoin, you cannot force me to take your Bitcoin. You can't, by law. Because it's not a legal tender. The government never has no government in the world besides El Salvador. I don't know if Panama has accepted it. There was a talk about it. I don't think he has finalized it. So we have to understand the concept of a legal tender in law, all right? I was telling you about the characteristic of virtual money. This virtual money that we are talking today, the, the digital wallet and all the stories, number one, commonly accepted as a medium of exchange in an area, not necessarily all over the world. Number two, we accept it as final payment. When you pay, it's paid already. It goes through a system, halas, number three, pass freely and fully transferred by delivery. So the moment I click, it goes through the machine into the system, be self-contained, requiring no collection, that is clearing or settlement. If not, it becomes like a check. For money, you don't need to have a settlement, right? And this is from the book, Private Law. Okay, there's another debate on that. I don't want to go into detail here, right? Money as a means of payment. Why money as a means of payment is important. If money is stolen, then on what basis to claim it without legal recognition? And this is where many hackers are stealing money and you can't sue them because it's not accepted as money. You follow what I'm trying to say? If a hacker hack into your wallet, you can't take him to court. He's not recognized, maybe in some countries. So how many people have lost money like this? I know personally. Doctrine of tracing. A dollar, as you know, all the notes that you have got a number on that. They got a chips, isn't it? Have you seen the money? You can trace it easily, right? Whereas with a money which is in the system through the blockchain, only the code will allow you to, tr to trace it. If you lose a tr code, you are gone. You lost everything. How many people have lost their code and they have lost the money also? They press the wrong button, they lost their money also, right? So this is the reality between fiat money and digital money. So we have seen a lot of people lost on Ethereum, for example. So these are the risks attached to it with wrong payment via the wrong key number, okay? If cryptocurrency is not a legal tender, that raises the issue of bail or stuff. From a free point of view, can we exchange it for money? Base self is like your forex, that is base self, money for money. So on what basis are we going to exchange currency, if we say it's a currency for money? For example, Bitcoin for dollars, for example, or Bitcoin for Ethereum, for example. These are the tricky questions that come to mind, all right? So does it qualify as money without regulation? Payment by means of a bank transfer shares many of the legal characteristics of a payment in physical currency, but credit card does not constitute money, though it is very convenient form of payment. Credit card is not money. It's just a facilitation of the transfer of money from your account to another account. The credit card itself is a plastic. It's not money. All right? So the payment through it, which is important. Number two, does cryptocurrency meet the criteria mentioned that is what we have mentioned here, right? So these are what we call senior money. You need an account, medium of exchange, store value, stability. And this is a view, what I told you earlier. Few scholars like Imam Malik, Ibn Qayyim, Zozi, Ibn Taymiyyah, they say understanding money is based on all. So further question, should money be a legal tender? Should money and currency be stable? Yes. Because if we're going to use money as a yardstick to buy and sell, a yardstick for value, if itself is not stable, the entire economy will not be stable. So if you tell me today Bitcoin is $20 and tomorrow is going to be $50, the end of the year is going to be $70,000, how can this be a yardstick of value in an economy? Yes, between individuals maybe, but at the economic level, at the national level, it cannot be. It becomes problematic, all right? Now, we're going to make you become muftis now. Right? Ready?
वह जो फतवा और क्रिप्टो करेंसी एस करेंसी ओके मुफ्ती आने के राम What is your fatwa on cryptocurrency as a currency? So, as you know, we have discussed what is the nature of money. It has to be a unit of account. Is cryptocurrency a unit of account? Yes or no? No. Why? It doesn't have fixed value. It just changes, and it's not a. It's not backed by the government. Yes, the government didn't make it a unit. The government did not make it a unit of value, all right? You follow what I'm saying? Can we break Bitcoin into smaller denomination? Yes. Yeah. Into what? It's a fraction of Bitcoin. Maybe could be a fraction of Bitcoin, or because people do buy things like you know they have one Bitcoin. They can buy with like you know uh, half of Bitcoin. So uh, how how do you call it? For example, dollar, one dollar can be hundred cents. Yeah. It doesn't have that denomination. So that's a problem. It need to have some units into it. Yeah. Medium of exchange is it a medium of exchange? No. I think it is a medium of exchange. Many people, for example, when it just came those days, about twenty years ago, you could buy a pizza with four bitcoin, one pizza, four bitcoin. Now is there one one bitcoin you can buy a car? Yeah, I think it is a medium of exchange for many people. Okay, uh, store of value. It is it is in your blockchain. Yeah, very well protected in your blockchain. It is a store of value. Uh, widely and commodity accepted based on all. Not, not yet. Yeah. In certain now, this is very important. Now, there are two types of all. All the arm and all the khas. All the arm is well spread in the community. And all the khas, few people are willing to accept something. So within the old fechas, if few people are willing to accept it, it will be acceptable. But it is not acceptable at the national level, right? So the difference between old fechas and old fecham is that okay? Is it a legal tender? No, it's not a legal tender, right? Bitcoin is not a legal tender. Yeah. Volatility, high volatility. So do you see so many negative things with it? From an economic point of view, from a legal point of view, to say it is a currency is problematic. It does not tick all the boxes. All right. Payment passed freely and fully transferred by delivery. I think yes. If you pay the boat call, you once you click on the button, the money leaves your wallet. Yeah. Uh, intrinsic value. <laughs> it is just some digital figures. Now, do you give? It's a very important question to ask. Is that Bitcoin or whatever Ethereum or whatever you want to use? If it is in your computer or your in your wallet. Does it have intrinsic value, or is your wallet, your phone, that is giving it value? So you say it got intrinsic value. Yes. Um, with crypto, wouldn't it be similar to any form of currency? Wouldn't it be similar to any form of value, like? No. If it's a problem. It's way, volatile. Today is twenty dollars. Tomorrow got no value. Tomorrow is disappeared. You can't trace it. But isn't it that for any currency, like no. Australian dollar, can tomorrow crash? Then for commodities and for uh, stocks as well, the value fluctuates. But yeah. It will when it become widely used and the accept uh, acceptability is uh, that it is acceptable worldwide. 
Yeah, that is the future. Right now, that's what the ulama is saying. It's very highly volatile. Let us take the example you given now. The the uh, a typical example is the one you gave about the Australian dollars. It's not going to crush like this because the government is backing it up. Right? I give you a simple example. If you remember a uh, few months ago, you got the Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, about a few banks after the one after the other was collapsing. It would have a direct impact on the dollars in the US a few months ago. So suddenly you find the central bank of different countries come together to save the dollars and save the banking. Whereas it's a Bitcoin crash and nobody cares. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yes, they want their own. The, this is why I say the digital currency. They will come up with that. But at this moment, we don't have it. So we are people are using Bitcoin, Ethereum, this type of things. So when you lose those things, do you say it's money, currency, or not? This is what the exercise we are doing, looking at the different theory of economics and fiqh. These are the characteristics of money. Does it satisfy this or not? It does some, for some it does not, as you can see. So this is where the ulama cannot give you a final decision until there is more certainty on this issue, right? Be self-contained, requiring no collection, clearing or settlement. Yes, okay. So you can see some of it is positive, some of it is negative in the light of the theories we have gone through, right? All right? Now, whether well, it's halal or haram, after you have gone through the exercise. Now, you are the mufti and the kiram. You must tell me. Is it is a currency or not? No. Doctor says no. Wait and see, I think. Hmm? Wait and see. Wait and see. Sabar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more to learn. We're just scratching the surface. Yeah. So we have you here. So we, you mean to tell us, are you? Sorry. Aren't you going to tell us if it's halal or no? No, 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 no. I will make so you. Everyone is coming here. So then they can invest. You may. I make you become mufti today. I give you a salad now. <laughs> it's somehow in the middle. It is in the middle. By the end of the day, uh, you will have to take that decision as an individual. You will go to muftis, two muftis will give you, I give, I'll show it to you. What is the, the spectrum of fatawa on that? Yeah. The Sheikh can there be anything like in the middle, like haram and halal? No, I don't think it will be haram. It's a question of, as an orf, would you accept it as a currency or not? Because, yeah, sure. I mean, can we use the mic, please? Because for the benefit of the system, please use the mic. Now, I'm saying that isn't the question itself a bit of controversy? Because you see, when you say haram, it's like a scene coming in my mind. You know? <laughs> oh, this is haram, man. Now, you know, we're talking about uh, whether it's, uh, it's uh, something good to have it or not to have it. Okay. You know, haram. Yeah, you say haram. So is it like now we are talking about uh, is some kind of scene happening? <laughs> I don't have any guns anyway. No, this is what is the mind of people. This is what is the mind of people. And exactly what you mentioned here, exactly what you are saying. Do we have this wallet or not? From the beginning, this is what I have said. The question of the Muslim, if you go back to the slide, is exactly what you say. What you want to know, this is why you are here, is can we buy with cryptocurrency? Right, that's a question you want to know. If I got five Bitcoin, can I hold it as a, an asset and can I convert it into dollars and buy something? That's, a, that's what you want to know, basically. Yeah, if you look at it, 
from a different angle, as I said, the issue of Urf Khas and Urf Haram. I discuss all this thing, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Malik, and so on. Looking where we are going, the direction we are going, my personal opinion, I may be wrong. Muftab, if I'm wrong, you correct me. For the time being, it does not form part of Urfe Am. It's not that everybody will accept Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is, right? You get 1,000, 10, 200, right? Say, for example, you are a businessman. I come and I want to pay you with Bitcoin. I tell you one Bitcoin is $20,000. He come to you, you want to pay with Ethereum. He tell you one Ethereum is uh, 10,000. It's problematic. Now, if me and you, we decide, okay, we fix Ethereum this amount of, we, within our circle, we are prepared to take that risk. It's not something to do with economy, we ourselves. In that context, that will be all fake has. In that context, it would be, in my humble opinion, acceptable. But it is not at a national level yet to impose it on the people. There is no law, there is no regulation. It's similar to a barter, for example, what we discussed in the beginning. Yeah, it's like a barter. You are willing to accept it, you are willing to take a loss between the people themselves. They accept something as a currency. I give you the examples of Khmer Rouge in the 1970s where the world, nobody will tell you rice is money, but they use it for that time they needed it. It was acceptable. It was all fair. Um, everybody was prepared to accept it because everybody needed rice. Rice become a yard of value. Yeah, rice become a store of value because rice, you can keep rice, etc. You follow? It does satisfy to a certain extent the functionality of money. So when you look at cryptocurrency, it is uh, from an old fair arm point of view, it's not widespread that everybody accepts it, uh, that the government is making a legal tender and so on and so forth. From that position, no, it is a no go. But if people among themselves are willing, in, uh, in fact, they are using it in many countries where you got your money with the bank in crypto, and when you want to use your debit card, the bank converts a crypto into your money. Yes. It's happening. It's already there. But that between you and the bank. You cannot go and tell somebody, look, I got 10 crypto in the bank, go and take it. You can't do that. For that person, he still needs his Australian dollars or uh, American, whatever it is. You, you understand what I'm saying? So it is there at a very elementary level. If people among themselves want to accept the risk, well and good. But at the national level, it is not a currency yet. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, do you think in the near future it will be regularized by the government or the, yes. the, the country? Yes. The government will come up with their own. The government will come up with their own. Uh, well, we should get them. <laughs> but the government wants. It's going to come. It's going to come. Yeah. The difference will be, let me tell you what the difference will be. If I got this, right, suppose this is $50, I come to your shop, you will accept it. You won't argue with me, yeah. right? And then you take this, you go to um, do your barber, you tell him, okay, cut my hair. He will accept it. It's a legal tender, right? The problem with a regulated currency, regulated, which means it's going to be programmed. And that's the problem. Will you be able to use it whenever you want, whenever you want? If you're blacklisted, you're stuck. You can't even use your wallet. You don't pay your tax, they go into your system. They can claim that directly from your money. You don't <laughs> <laughs> no money laundering. <laughs> yes. I heard in, in about 10, 20 years' time, uh, money is going to be not like banks are not going to accept it. Yes. Is that very true, yeah? This is what I say. The, the young generation does not want to, wor to work with fiat money. They want to use the, 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 the digital wallet. Yeah. 
I mean, leave it. The, the, our generation, my generation, when I'm traveling, I don't carry cash. I use my my debit card. My, you understand what I'm saying? Where are we to carry money with me? We are thinking, whatever you go, now we are using what's called Revolut. Revolut because with Revolut, you can keep three accounts, Euro, whatever. So you economizing on the exchange of, isn't it? With Revolut card, you just pay with that. You go to Turkey, you want to pay with that. So you don't lose money in exchange. Commission. So people are doing all those things nowadays. Yes. So you're, so you're saying that, um, do I think that this is going to be halal or haram? Well, I think I don't have an uh, uh, option because I didn't think we had options with notes and currency, you know what I mean, like money. So the same thing with this. It will be regularized, regularized, definitely, by the government. And this is what some ulama are saying. Wait for the government to finalize it. Let it and the government, for there are many reasons, I don't want to go in, in the, the, the economics and the politics of, of this whole debate here. There are reasons why governments are not finalizing it. You know that they don't want to do it. There are reasons. They've got to think properly. Yeah? So as stands now, people are already working with it. It's coming, you want it or not. In some countries, it's already there, like in Nigeria, in Iran. People are using their phone, they are paying with their phone, and so on and so forth. They are not paying with fiat money. So instead of paying with your, stick with your, how we call it, your debit card, right? You are using your money, your, your mobile phone, and your mobile phone is linked to a system, a merchant, or whatever you want to call it. Because when you use a debit card, it's not directly with the bank, you use a merchant. You use Visa or Master Mastercard, isn't it? Yeah. It's not directly with the bank. It's a merchant that you use. The same thing will happen. There, you'll have the central bank with the big data. They will have all the nation, the account. But when you're going to pay, there will be an agent through which you will go. This is how it's going to be, in my opinion. Yeah. Yes. So, Chef, um, if we hold crypto as an asset, or if we trade in the market with it, buying and selling with it, it should be all right because we're not using it at a national scale currently because it's not regularized. Do you think holding as an asset and if I'm buying and selling, it should be fine? We're coming to the second question if you're interested. <laughs> Shall we continue? Or you are tired? It's up to the audience, Mashallah. Because the second question is coming now. Is it an asset or not? Because so far we have discussed the theory of money, the currency aspect. This crypto asset I haven't started yet. If you are tired, we stop here. Next year, if you want, I come next year. How <laughs> suffer? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give up on them. <laughs> what do you do? We continue or we stop? Continue. All right. Okay. Okay, let's come to this issue of asset. Now, here's your question that you have asked. One is... The same money, the same blockchain, we're going to call it a token. I want to raise money, I got my own token, right? Instead of shares, I'm giving you crypto. We have already used it. There is a property in Mecca where they have issued a crypto token. The name of it is Kintar. Yes. So they have raised money. And in exchange of that, once the property is built, what I've understood from the people who work on it, you will have like a timeshare on it. Because you, in exchange of that, say for 10 years, you can spend one month every year, something like this. So this is known as Qintar, Q-I-N-T-A-R. Check it on your, on your Google, you will find it, Qintar. This was issued to build up a property in Haram. It was issued in Geneva. All right. So now we are not talking about currency here. We are talking of a token. We call it a token, which is like a share. And that is share now. Is it a mali mutakawit to buy and sell? Okay. So what is mal? What constitute 
a mal, a commodity in Sharia. Mal is a non-human thing created for the interest of human beings capable of possession and transaction. There is by free will. This is by al hawi Al-Qudsi. Mal is what gives benefit. That according to Allama Sadaqsi. Another definition of what constitutes commodity is in the Majalla, that is the codification of Islamic law by the Ottoman. That which is naturally desired by men, mala yamilu, your heart inclined towards it, is become a commodity and can be stored for the time of necessity. Then another definition according to Imam Shafi'i, what really constitutes commodity, that which has value with which it is exchangeable and the destroyer of it would be made liable to pay compensation and what the people would not usually throw away or disown. So it has money and the likes. This is according to Imam Shafi'i. So something naturally desired by man, it must be capable of being owned and possessed. It must be capable of being stored. It must be beneficial in the eyes of Sharia. It must have manfa. The ownership of the thing must be assignable and transferable. Do you think cryptocurrency, crypto asset has those qualities? It has? No. So, okay. We can go home now. <coughs> get your fatwa. All right. Chef, I don't exactly read the number 4, 5, 4. So it must be beneficial in the eyes of Sharia. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Why? So you see the one kind, the, the one who invented one kind. The lady one? now, she's uh, one of the 10 most wanted uh, FBI, you know. So, uh, she invented that one and uh, many people actually invested in that. So, and she, like, uh, okay, uh, one out of 2,000 tokens, what is the probability? No, no, I'm taking into account what you say. As a general rule, this happened. We, I know about this case personally. So, out of 12, 12, uh, 1,200, 2,000 types of tokens out there. One, because it is a legal maxim, al shaz kal adam al shaz kal adam Something which is very, very, very remote, as if it doesn't exist. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, you got a point. I'm not arguing your point, but there is the other side of the coin where if we take that position, we got to neglect everything on the market. Yeah. Taqawwum, value in the eyes of Sharia. Taqawwum refers to an asset having value in Islam so that it can be lawfully traded and compensated upon destruction. This is why you call it mal mutaqawwim This is a mal mutaqawwim because in Islam it is lawfully traded. Everybody knows it is jais in Sharia. You can buy and sell it. And if you break it, you got to pay me back. That is mal mutaqawwim Very important, those concepts in fiqh. Next, in the value of eyes, tamania refers to something having the following critical function. This is when we say it must have this value. It means independent standard of value, unit of account, accepted medium of exchange. These are three qualities. Again, I think it will have it. Differentiate between currency. I'm talking as an asset here, as a commodity. Can we consider it as a commodity to buy and sell, not something to use to buy things? The, the, the token itself, can it be a commodity? That's what we're discussing here. Just like a share on the market, you want to raise money, you issue shares, you get money. Some company will issue tokens and they get money and they finance a company. So once you get it as a token, can you sell it on the secondary market? Because maybe this is where you people you want to buy, you will go on the specific market where it's like Hong Kong, crypto market, you go and buy it. Just like shares. This is what is happening now. Yeah? It is live. You can check it now if you want. Yes. So Sheikh, the Imam Shafi's definition of the money is that... Uh, not money, not money. Sorry, the assets is that. Asset, I said. Yes, is that, that uh, I mean, if there's a compensation if somebody is destroying it, so... In this case, we can't actually 
get any compensation if you know, so somebody's hacking in our wallet or anything happens. For example, Hong Kong happens many times. There are a lot of money. So yes, the hacking issue is a serious issue. But How are you this money? Who's in this? Okay, money? what if somebody stole your, your car, uh, your, your money, you don't see it? You can't trace it? In our case, actually, we have a law. We can go and restore the law. The, the, the finding of the thief is another matter. But in, in this one, I, we can't even claim that somebody has stolen my money from my wallet. It, this happened recently with Ethereum. It happened. And it was protected by the company. Because remember, it is in the system, in the blockchain. Ultimately, you can trace it, ultimately. Bitcoin is a bit difficult because Bitcoin is really decentralized. So what are the other ones? There are laws on that. However, the, for example, the, the car case, we have the insurance companies is backed by the big banks, backed by another big banks. Yeah. So here, the other system is going on here. However, this as crypto asset, there is not none exists yet. In, in that case, I think the... Uh, yes, I got your point. Now, there are two types. One type of crypto asset tokens, they are backed by assets like gold. Yes, if you make your research, you'll see. I was approached to work on a project. It has not been come to fruition yet. Where somebody wanted to plant trees, say one million trees. And they want to issue one token, say token X for a tree. So if you want two trees, you get two tokens. And say each plant would be, say, $10. So one token is $10. Two tokens will be $2. $2, you get uh, $20, you get two trees. Now, after five years, those trees are being planted to be cut and make wood or whatever. After five years, that plant that was 50p would worth maybe 20, 30 pounds too late. Yes. Yeah, okay. Molana, tell me we must go fast. Okay, let's go fast. Okay, sorry, Shay. So I've discussed money in the Quran. You can uh, discuss this. Now, money in Islamic history, as you can see, Imam Abdul Bar states that Muslims of the prophetic era use a Roman dinar, as I told you. Uh, Karif Abdul Malik is the first one to introduce Islamic dinar in the 76th Hijri, seven years ago. And then you have the Mamluk. This is very, very interesting. They were the first one who monopolized the minting of money, the Mamluk in Egypt. That was in the year 872. Hijri, that is 1517. Then the Ottoman produced a currency named Kaima in the form of paper money in 1914. Remember 1914 to 1917 was the First World War. This is where it says a fiat money comes. So the, they use it as well. Many people don't know that. And this is the Islamic State, okay? Money, according to Muslim Jewish, they got two characteristics. Tamane khilqi, that is like gold. Naturally, it has value. And tamane orfi, the custom gives it value, all right? Factions of money are discussed with your deed. This also for something to be money, uh, uh, acceptability, divisibility, portability, scarcity, durability. These are the characteristics we look for money, right? Centralization, okay, there's a big debate whether you centralize it or not, okay? Why did the Jews favor centralization like Imam Shafi and so on? Practice of the time requires governance, something for the benefit of the entire community. Uh, it is regulated, there is trust, a system into it. This is why the Fukaha of the past, though originally it was not centralized, as I explained you in the time of Umar bin Khattab, but later on, they say, okay, the Caliph want to centralize it. These are the reasons why they say it should be centralized. Is it necessary? Abdullah Mania, which is a great alim from Saudi, he said money is just whatever is agreed to be such, whether by government, authority, or public practice. Imam Tamiyah says the reality is that the Quran and Sunnah have not defined currency, instead they have left it to the understanding of the people and custom of the people. So inherent features of cryptocurrency has no intrinsic value, has no physical form, exists only in digital form, supply is not determined by central bank, it is stateless, 
uh, not issued or controlled by company, no a single person. So these are the disadvantages, right? So the holder has ownership or not. Uh, no records are kept to identity. That also can be a problem when it is decentralized. Uh, easy to keep anonymous. That can lead to misrepresentation. Impossible to recover if lost or stolen in the case of Bitcoin specifically. So is it a commodity? Yes, I would tell you it is a commodity to cut it short. Uh, because a time will come when one will not care about how he gets things, whether legally or illegally. This is a hadith. Now, to discuss whether something is a commodity in Sharia, there are three stages. There is a paper by Mufti Khali Sefuda Rahmani on that. One, Sharia tells you is a commodity, like gold. One, the language, the Arabic language, determines it's a commodity or not. The third one, the ORF tells you it is a commodity or not. That will be based on ORF. And if you look at the, the concept, but it's simply here, my, in a short term, it would be acceptable as a commodity. That is my, you, you 